Good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, to another J Talk uh, from Joseph Brandt Hospital. If you don't recognize me from previous J Talks, my name is Dr. Stephen Selchin. I am the Chief of Psychiatry and Deputy Chief of Staff at Joseph Brandt Hospital here in Burlington. And I am joined this evening uh, by Dr. Dale Kalina, who you probably recognize from previous J Talks as well. Um, Dale is an infectious uh, disease specialist and has uh, been at the helm of our infection prevention and control. Uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. And uh, although I believe that term has ended, Dale continues to provide us uh, um, uh, his expert um, uh, advice and support and, uh, and uh, efforts as we continue uh, through this second wave of the pandemic. And uh, thank you, Dale, very much for uh, being here this evening. Thanks for having me, Steve. Um, I believe our, our topic this evening, our hot topic is the vaccines. Everybody wants to know all kinds of things about uh, vaccines. And so we will take your questions about vaccination. Um, feel free to, to send those in and, and we will get to those. Um, wondering if, uh, if we, before we get to some of those questions, Dale, if, uh, if you want to give us just a little bit of an update of, of where we're at with COVID. Yeah, I think that that's a great idea, Steve. I, just to, to start off the bat, I think that it's important to recognize that we, of course, are now in a state of emergency that was announced uh, on Tuesday. Uh, so it is important for everybody to really only be leaving your house if it is completely necessary. So um, you shouldn't be leaving your house for anything that's discretionary. You should really just be leaving your house um, for emergencies uh, to get food and water um, and really, if you have to think about whether it's an important reason to leave your house, maybe it isn't. And, and I would encourage everybody to recognize <clears throat> that it's, it's to help decrease the risk of exposure to the virus. And it's just the reality of um, the situation right now with the pandemic locally uh, and really across the country right now. The, the healthcare system that we have uh, is set up so that we're able to provide the best care for a certain number of people. And the unfortunate truth is that we're getting very close to that upper limit of what we're able to do. And I don't want to see anything go past that limit because then some very difficult decisions, some of which are, are being seen, especially south of the border right now, unfortunately will have to be made here too. And the most important thing that we can all do is look out for one another. And the best way I think everybody in our community can do that is by staying home, um, by making sure you get tested if you do feel symptoms, by making sure that you stay far apart from other people um, if you do develop any symptoms. And if you are close to other people, if you're uh, moving around, um, wear a mask, uh, make sure you wash your hands as well. And, and really when you are given the opportunity, get the vaccine. I hear there are going to be some questions about that, though. Oh, what a fantastic segue! Um, but yeah, I mean, really, you know, all, all joking aside, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hearing loud and clear. It's so easy at this point, understandably, after being through this for so long, and also with this, you know, the vaccine on the horizon. I can imagine uh, lots of people wanting to just kind of ease up on some of this and, and hope we're kind of at the finish line. Um, but really, um, I think the message that I'm hearing from you loud and clear, um, and uh, in which I agree, this is, this is actually the time to make everything we've been through until this point, uh, to make it worthwhile, to make it count for something. This is the time for us to really pay attention um, to, um, uh, to everything that we can do um, to, uh, to stop the spread. Uh, at this point. Yeah, I think that it's, I think the way that I've been thinking about it is it's kind of like a marathon race and, and God, God knows we're tired, right? Everybody is. Uh, I, I'm not just speaking for healthcare workers, but I know that the, the restrictions in the community have been difficult. I know how hard it is not to be able to see loved ones, friends and family uh, and other, other people. I, it's difficult not to, not to be able to, to reg, uh, operate in our regular lives. And, and I, that fatigue is a, is a very real thing. And I know that, but we were just so close to that finish line, you know, with being able to use some of those tools like vaccines to help keep those, uh, worry, uh, those people who are high risk safer. And, and it's just important to use everything that we've learned over the course of the past almost a year now 
to use all of those skills that we've been honing and we've been working on over the past several months, now's the time. Now's the time really to put them into use. Yeah, well said, thank you. Uh, folks, if you're just joining us, uh, Dr. Stephen Selchin, Chief of Psychiatry, Deputy Chief of Staff at Joseph Brandt Hospital. Uh, welcome, joined by Dr. Dale Kalina, our infectious diseases specialist. Um, and we are taking your questions about COVID and the vaccine um, and they are, they are filling up. So we've got a question from Doug. Have the nursing homes in Burlington started immunizations? Yeah, so that's a great question. Thanks, Doug. So uh, for starters, there are kind of two patient or two populations of people within the long-term care sector. So there's the residents, people that live in those homes, and there's also the healthcare workers uh, who provide those people care within the long-term homes. So there are kind of two different rollouts and they're both underway right now in Halton region. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, there are healthcare providers that have been receiving the vaccine for several weeks now. Um, and that was in part because of some of the transportation difficulties associated with the vaccine specifically that they're getting. And then for the residents themselves, they're getting a, a vaccine that's slightly easier to transport. So there have been teams that are going into homes in long-term care homes in Halton region and all the regions around us uh, to be able to start vaccinating those individuals. Great, thank you. This next question asks um, about the JBH nursing and patient facing staff, um, have they received their vaccines? Yeah, so that's some, uh, some have, that's a really great question. So the way that the vaccine rollout has, has worked, especially with the healthcare workers rollout, uh, primarily directed towards those long-term care uh, um, staff members that I mentioned. So where there was some difficulty or some gaps uh, in getting uh, some of those workers vaccinated. If there were those gaps, some healthcare workers have been filling in some of those spaces. So we have had the opportunity to have a number of our staff at Joseph Brandt vaccinated as well. And, uh, and those staff that were prioritized really were frontline healthcare workers and individuals who are working primarily, especially with COVID patients in a variety of different roles at the hospital. So really proud that some of our staff really have been able to be vaccinated so far. Thanks. Um, and uh, uh, this question says, what is the vaccine that is currently being distributed? Oh, two questions. What's the vaccine that's currently being distributed? So there's, there's two vaccines that are approved in Canada right now. Um, so just uh, as a reminder, the approval process for, for any medication, including vaccines in Canada, goes through Health Canada approvals processes. Uh, which are completely independent of, of any pharmaceutical provider. Uh, they're independent of other physicians that prescribe the medication, such as myself. Um, and they're independent of, uh, of any other oversight. So they're a, a completely unbiased process uh, to evaluate whether the medication works and is useful and also whether it's safe. So that's the type of process that's uh, under that, uh, that is being used. Uh, for all medications, including the two vaccines that have already been approved. So there's two, as I mentioned, uh, one was produced by Pfizer and, uh, and BioNTech, and the other one was produced by a company called Moderna. Uh, so Pfizer is a pharmaceutical company out of uh, Europe, and uh, Moderna is a pharmaceutical company and biotech firm out of the United States. Uh, both of the vaccines themselves are very similar types of vaccines. They're these mRNA vaccines. So mRNA is genetic material. And the difference is in a traditional vaccine, you inject a little bit of a, a viral protein, for instance, uh, or an inactivated virus in certain situations uh, so that the body's immune system can react to it. The difference here is that with these two vaccines that are produced, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, uh, you're injecting the blueprint to make that protein that the immune system will then react to. So the way that that's more beneficial is that if you're only able to inject say 100 proteins, your body will be able to develop an immune response to those. But if you're able to inject 100 blueprints, the body can produce hundreds of thousands of those proteins to produce that immune reaction. Now, I know some of the questions that have been asked of me are, what about that protein? Is that safe? And is that protein able to give me the infection itself? No, it is not. It's not able to give you that, that uh, uh, reaction at all. 
Um, so you can't get the infection from the shot or from that mRNA. What I like to think of it as, it's kind of like uh, the protein on, that is produced with that mRNA, it's kind of like a license plate on a car. A license plate can't drive a car around, but if you show that license plate to the police, they'll know how to catch that stolen car with that license plate. In the same way, that protein is an identifier and that identifier is attached to the, uh, the COVID virus, which can then cause the infection. But if the immune system, which has already been vaccinated, can recognize it really early, it'll be able to fight off that infection or sort of to catch the bad guys uh, early on. So no, it can't cause any actual infection, but yes, they work really well. And those are the two vaccines that are already approved here in Canada. Very helpful. And you also seem to know a surprising amount about stolen cars. So we'll circle back to that later. Um, Dale, uh, this question is from, I think, Sheree. Sorry if it's Sherry, but I think it's Sheree. Is, is JBH doing vaccines? Oh, that's a really great question, Sheree. Um, so at Joseph Brand Hospital right now, we are not one of the vaccine sites. I believe there's uh, 18 va approved vaccine sites across the province right now. And Joseph Brandt Hospital was not identified as one of them. Uh, so the approved vaccine site in Halton region uh, is at Halton Healthcare. Uh, I believe they're actually using their Oakville Trafalgar Memorial Hospital site to help facilitate those vaccines. As the rollout continues through different phases of the rollout, perhaps that may change in time, but I actually don't have line of sight to that. And, uh, and we certainly have not uh, heard of what those additional phases will look like across the province. Okay, we will keep people posted as we, uh, as we know more. Um, uh, Dale, this is from Lindsay. What is the direction for pregnant and breastfeeding women uh, and any benefit to the babies? Yeah, so uh, that is a question that's been coming up a lot recently. Uh, the studies that uh, looked at the safety and efficacy of these two vaccines did not primarily look at uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women. That said, it does stand to reason and to science that there would be no increased risk to pregnant and lactating women because of the type of vaccine that it is and the way that we know that vaccines work. So there really wouldn't be any reason to expect any adverse reactions and there wouldn't be any reason to expect that the vaccine wouldn't work. The Society of, of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada uh, has recommended uh, that pregnant and breastfeeding women be offered the vaccine and not be precluded from uh, getting the vaccine itself. It's always an important conversation to have uh, with your primary healthcare provider, with your obstetrician, and to recognize the risks of uh, being exposed to COVID and the potential complications of the infection itself. What I can say is that uh, I uh, agree with the statement from the SOGC, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada, uh, that there's no reason to believe that the vaccine is unsafe and that it is very reasonable for people who are pregnant and breastfeeding to consider uh, getting the vaccine and really to get vaccinated. Um, thank you. What about, what's the, what's the youngest age that one can get a vaccine? This is from Jalen and, and when will there be a vaccine available for kids? Yeah. So again, it goes back to the studies where efficacy and safety data, uh, is, was developed for both of these vaccines. So both of the vaccines had a lower age limit of 16. So we know that people that are 16 years of age and older are suitable to receive the vaccine because it is safe and works well in those patients. Now, for people below those ages, we don't yet have that data. My understanding is that that data is being investigated right now. So hopefully we'll have that information soon. The comforting part to that though, is that we do know that people below the age of 20 really don't have a high risk of of um, severe COVID uh, disease itself, and also very negligibly have any severe uh, adverse reactions uh, to the virus itself. So it's not a patient population that seems to do particularly poorly with this virus, which is comforting 
given that we aren't able to give the vaccine in that population. But I do expect more data to be uh, uh, released um, as uh, more experience has ha been had with the vaccine. Um, so then in that spirit, here's a here's a bit of a hardball from Gary. Is it really the schools then that are at risk? Um, from what I've read, the spread isn't there. Do they need to stay closed? Yeah, so that is a, 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 a very different question. So <laughs> that speaks to the level of risk and, and the way that the, vac the, the the virus itself is spread. Schools have been working exceptionally hard um, and, and I have to disclose as well that I'm biased. I've been working with some schools to be able to help uh, as well, but schools have been working very hard uh, to curb the spread of virus in their uh, institutions. Some schools have been able to institute things like barrier protection methods, you know, plexiglass, um, masks as well. And I think that masks are always, always helpful uh, for anyone of any age, I would like to be clear. Um, I can't speak to the level of actual spread within the schools. I think that at the end of the day, schools are particularly important for younger people, especially children for whom it really is very difficult to have e-learning and things like that. Um, I think that with the level of spread in the community at large right now, the risk of kids getting infections in general is quite high as, as it is for anybody that's in our community. And with that in mind, I don't think that it's necessarily safe from that perspective to have schools open because community spread is so high. I don't think that that necessarily means that schools are the primary place where infections are being spread. I think we have seen a lot of spread of infections in um, you know, carpooling, multi-generational housing, um, and certainly uh, some other places of work as well. I don't know that schools have been primarily identified as large outbreak zones, uh, but I, at the same time, I don't know that it's necessarily safe for children to be in school right now. And so maybe just following up um, on on that, and we've talked about this before in, in J talks, but if uh, if the uh, the children are at less risk of serious illness. Um, but uh, um, clarifying then why, if they got COVID, why it would be such a such a problem. Yeah, so you're right. Children, as I've said, are at a, at a very low risk for having severe COVID infections. So really the biggest problem that's associated with it uh, is the fact that children can still spread that infection to others. So yes, it is certainly a concern of their teachers who provided they, they are masking and distancing and so on and so forth to the best of their ability, but there is always that risk. Um, and also the people that the children live with. Uh, so if people, if children are getting the, uh, the virus itself, they can still spread it to, to their parents, their grandparents, et cetera. And especially as we have larger groups, um, we have uh, different um, sizes of classes, it's a, an infection control risk because you can have a high volume of people that can get sick. And that's where the real problem is. And so parents that are thinking, um, we've got the kids at home, they're going a little stir crazy. Maybe it's okay to have a play date for a kid. What would you say? I would recommend against play dates. Um, now, Full disclosure, I don't have children. Uh, my dog does not have play dates with other dogs though. Um, but, uh, but joking aside, it is difficult. And I, and I recognize that I really can't, I, I sympathize with parents uh, who have children at home who are going stir crazy, but I would encourage people to have safe play time, right? Um, that would be outside, that would be in small groups of people and hopefully distanced. I think that being able to um, decrease the risk of individual exposures by doing things outside, small numbers, things like that are better. But if at all possible, I would encourage for that to be avoided. Encourage self-play, encourage playing uh, with siblings, encourage playing with people that are under the same household. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is decrease the number of people that uh, that one might be exposed to if you happen to get the infection. 
Thanks, Dale. Um, this one isn't uh, technically about COVID, but how many people have the flu this year? Or maybe uh, that's from Leslie, but maybe expand on that. What's going on with the flu? Yeah, Leslie, that's that's one of the few good news stories we've got right now, actually. Um, so thank you for letting me talk about that. Um, right now, um, in any regular cold and flu season, we would be seeing a high degree of uh, community spread of the flu. The reality is right now, we're seeing almost none. Uh, and it's really good news. So great job on everybody getting their flu vaccines. Great job on people masking and distancing. It's all working to help curb that rate of the flu. So our already overwhelmed healthcare system won't have to help people with that as well. We do have some sporadic cases of the flu that we are seeing on occasion around our area, uh, but it's very, very different from our regular flu seasons. Thank you. Um, uh, this one's from Barb. Uh, my husband has cancer is getting, and is getting home care. Sorry, Barb. Um, when might he be able to get the vaccine? So there is an ethical framework uh, that's been produced by the government uh, to as to who uh, gets the vaccine and in what order. So it is a vaccine framework that is geared towards vac excuse me, vaccinating higher risk individuals first and lower risk individuals later. Um, that's at a very high level, of course. Within that ethical framework, we are also prioritizing people that need to care for and are at very high risk for exposure to COVID as well. And that's in part where we're seeing uh, the uh, healthcare workers, especially in long-term care homes being vaccinated. Beyond that, uh, people who are receiving home care and people who are part of um, home care, palliative care, ongoing cancer care programs were also a specific group that was identified by the government as a high priority group. So while I can't give you a specific time frame for when uh, your uh, loved one is going to be vaccinated, I can say that there is certainly a recognition that people that are at higher risk will be vaccinated sooner. Um, and, uh, and I think that that's very reasonable. Thank you. And so in that spirit, Sheila asks, I'm a 69 year old caregiver for my husband who is 84. Will I get a shot at the same time as him? Um, I, again, I, I'm not 100% sure on the, on the precise timing. So I, I think that there has been some talk about uh, providing COVID vaccines to essential caregivers and to um, caregivers for those in long-term care homes and also um, in uh, those who are receiving home care, et cetera. I would expect that that will all become very clear as we get into later phases of the vaccine rollout. My understanding is that it's going to be kicked into high gear kind of throughout the late winter and early spring, um, which I, for one, am very excited about. Um, but I expect that a lot more um, will become a lot clearer as time goes on. Great, thank you. Uh, folks, if you're just joining us, uh, I'm Dr. Stephen Selchin at Joseph Brand Hospital, uh, Chief of Psychiatry, Deputy Chief of Staff here in Burlington, joined by Dr. Dale Kalina, our infectious disease specialist, um, and who has been uh, providing us with extraordinary leadership uh, throughout, uh, uh, throughout the pandemic. We are answering questions. Uh, well, I'm asking, he's answering questions about uh, the COVID vaccine in particular. Um, we, uh, uh, we are uh, meant to wrap up shortly and, and we will, but there are still a few more questions. Um, so we'll try to get to as many of those, of those as we can before we wrap up. And of course, um, uh, we've been doing Facebook Live um, and, and JTalks uh, throughout the pandemic um, uh, with, uh, with the assistance of uh, the JBH Foundation. Thank you very much folks behind the scenes for making all of this happen. And so we will continue to do JTalks and, and can get to uh, more questions in the future. Um, but a few more, Dale, um, uh, if you can. Um, uh, so this isn't actually about the uh, vaccine itself, but uh, Barbara would like to know how many patients are in the field hospital? Oh, um, that's a great uh, question. So uh, what Barbara is referring to is the pandemic response unit, uh, which is the field hospital that we have built at Joseph Brandt Hospital which we opened last week. Um, so uh, the last time I checked, we had fewer than six people that were admitted to the pandemic response unit right now. 
we do have a capacity of, I believe, 73. Uh, so we're not quite near that limit yet. So we do have um, capacity to continue uh, providing people with that level of care as well. I'm hopeful that we won't need to use all of those beds, but we sure are ready if need be. Okay. Um, and Sherry wants to know if JBH will be turning away breast cancer. Oh, sorry. Hang on a second. Um, will be will JBH be turning away breast cancer follow up exams due to COVID? Sorry, Steve. What was that? Will JBH be will JBH be turning away breast cancer follow up exams due to COVID? And you can also oh. flip you can also flip questions back to me at any point. But, uh... <laughs> Steve, what do you think about that? No, uh, so no, we won't. Uh, so emergency, uh, emergency, I'm sorry, uh, urgent ongoing care is still being provided at Joseph Brandt Hospital. Um, we have never had to shut, to shut down uh, emergency and urgent care at Joseph Brandt through the entire pandemic. And it is certainly something that we've been very proud to be able to continue to support our community in that way. Um, cancer screening, uh, cancer clinics, uh, cancer surgeries, and a variety of other um, clinics as well are ongoing. I think it's important to recognize as well is that some of the major places that we are seeing higher volumes of COVID patients and where we're certainly seeing that crunch is on a lot of the inpatient services. So people who are admitted to the hospital, either onto, into the ward uh, or into the intensive care unit uh, require a lot of care and require a lot of personnel uh, to be able to help provide them with that care. But provided care is, um, especially within say day surgeries, ambulatory care, outpatient care and the like, um, we are doing our very best to limit any sort of um, uh, decreased activity that might be impacted uh, by COVID itself. So as of right now, all of our outpatient clinics are operating at full capacity. All of our uh, day surgery and surgical teams are operating, I think actually above full capacity. And there's a very strong um, uh, will at, uh, at Joseph Brand Hospital to allow for that to continue. It is really important to recognize, and I know that we've said it in a variety of different ways, but to be direct, there are a lot of people that have other conditions. There are a lot of other diseases. There are, there are mental health crises. There is cancer. There are a lot of other conditions that we can continue to provide care for, for our community. That's what we're here for. The hospital is still open, the emergency room is still open, and we are still providing that level of care. Where we're concerned is of course, with the level of care that's needed for COVID patients. And that's why we ask people to stay home. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I think, I think that point you make about the will um, uh, uh, to do what we can, I mean, you know, folks, um, I mean, that's what, that's what our frontline clinicians and our leaders throughout the hospital um, and everybody that works within the hospital system um, and our health care system and our partners have been working in Burlington, you know, essentially round the clock since the start of this pandemic to um, as best we can continue um, the, those services and where possible when things that we had to shut down to bring those back online in ways that, um, that could be sustained. And that is the, uh, uh, that is, um, that's the aim. There are, you know, there, there are limits depending on what happens in the province, um, but there's huge dedication. Um, one of the things that I'm most proud of our staff around uh, to, uh, to make sure that we continue to respond to the needs of the community as much as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and we know that, we know that many of you know that, um, uh, and we see it in the appreciation uh, that you express back to uh, uh, back to the hospital. So this is really this is about all of us together as a community um, doing what each of us can in our roles, whether it is staying at home um, to decrease the spread, whether it's coming to the hospital as a patient or as a um, as a physician or clinician in order to uh, to meet people's needs. Um, Dale, this is from Lori. Uh, once my elderly parents are vaccinated, will I be able to visit them in their own home? So when people are vaccinated, the, the, the most important thing that happens is that they're unable to get a severe COVID infection. So certainly the risk 
to your parents once they are fully vaccinated is far lower. I'm expecting to see more guidelines developed around the vaccine as more, excuse me, as more people do get vaccinated in the community as well. However, I don't expect to see a widespread change in those guidances and those and in those recommendations until a larger percentage of the population is vaccinated. I think the reality is the people that are being vaccinated right now are those who we have done our best to protect in our community. And this is a, uh, an extension of that. So we won't see numbers of COVID cases starting to go down as a result of the vaccine for quite some time. And as a result of that, and recognizing that a lot of the, the restrictions that we have and a lot of the uh, government uh, mandates are based on daily numbers and case counts and hospitalizations. So it's not just the risk to individuals, but it's the risk in the population at large. And I know that sometimes it's hard to wrap one's head around that. Uh, it certainly was uh, for me in medical school, uh, but after a while I got it. Uh, but uh, joking aside, it's, it's not just one's individual risk. It's not just one's um, individual risk of a severe infection. It's also the population at large. And that really does underscore how important it is for us to continue to do those distancing and uh, masking measures uh, for, for some time as the vaccine is being rolled out so that we will be able to protect our community and, and uh, continue to thrive. Um, so Dale, about those numbers, Kevin asks, should we believe the numbers they're saying? It seems really frightening. The numbers are important to believe. Uh, they are very high and they are frightening. Um, I don't think that it's, I think that it's important not to mince words and not to, to dance around it. The numbers are far higher than I am comfortable with and far higher than I think anybody should be comfortable with. With, with any percentage of, of these numbers being as high as they are, a certain percentage of them will be severe cases. And with that, we know that the, our health, healthcare system will be stretched um, beyond where it is right now. And that's what I worry about most. The thing that I, always try to think about uh, when I see numbers that are as high as they are and seeing uh, people in the community that maybe are, are not taking the precautions that I feel are necessary is that I remember that although I can't change everybody, I can't change the, the way that everybody is interacting with others, I can change how I interact with people. And I can, I, I can help uh, to encourage those that I know and love and those who are close to me uh, to to be operating in safe ways and to be uh, making sure that they're, um, that they're themselves, that they're staying safer. And it's one thing for healthcare providers like me uh, or people in the news and so on and so forth to be um, talking about numbers and talking about how important it is to stay home. But it's an entirely different thing to hear that from somebody that you know and somebody that you love. Uh, and so I would always encourage every one of you to, to have those conversations with people that you love, to talk about uh, why it might be important to stay home, why it might be important not to share a meal together, why, although you, you love somebody and want to share coffee with them or something, maybe now is really just not safe. There are safer ways to engage with people. There are safe ways um, to, to socialize with people. And, and I know that they're not as fun. I know that uh, it's, it's something that I certainly miss of being able to see people in person, but it's, it's a lot, it, it means a lot more, I think, uh, for people to hear it from somebody that they know that it's not the time right now. And that, that is what will start to decrease those numbers. Thank you. Uh, Sherry wants to know if the pharmacies will be giving the vaccine when it's available. And if yes, do you know which ones? I don't know. Uh, I've, I've heard those uh, rumors in the media as well. Uh, and I don't unfortunately have any uh, stronger line of sight to, to where those vaccines will be provided. I think there's a, an important role uh, for lots of uh, community-based vaccine centers, um, if that is the direction that they go in. Uh, but to be clear, I'm not part of those vaccine committees. Um, so I uh, learn all of that information with the rest of you. Okay. Um, uh, Anne asks, my mom, who's a senior, walks in her neighborhood every day. 
with the increased number of people walking and running, does the virus linger in the air with the cold weather? Do you recommend wearing a mask outside at this time? So I think that it's great that your mother and that everybody is continuing to get exercise, especially in a safe way. I think that exercising outside, provided you are staying distanced from other people, is very safe. The risks associated with, with um, spreading the virus in those sorts of situations are quite low. Now, if you are in a situation where you don't believe that you will be able to keep a distance from other people, um, and that distance, of course, is two meters from anybody else, um, then a mask is sure helpful. Uh, and I will say, uh, in the cold weather, uh, it also actually kind of keeps you warm. So uh, there's a double benefit to that one, I'd say. Great. Uh, Helen says, I have an EpiPen to use if I get bee stings. Can I still get the vaccine? Yeah, that's a really great question, Helen. Um, so the recommendation, there's been a lot of recommendations and a lot in the news about, um, about the allergic reactions that some people have been having to the vaccine. So you can only have an allergic reaction if you were allergic to one of the components of the vaccine. So to figure out what's inside the vaccine, you can go to um, covid-vaccine.canada.ca or Google Canada um, COVID vaccines, and they'll have a list of the ingredients that are in the vaccines so that you'll know if there's something that you're allergic to in there. If there isn't anything that you know that you're allergic to in there, you're not allergic to it because you have to have already been exposed to it to have been able to develop an allergy. I think it's always great to keep your EpiPen around you, especially when there is a risk of being stung by a bee. Uh, I think that it would be a very good idea, uh, Helen, for you to get vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, though, um, provided you are not allergic to any of the components of the vaccine itself. Great, thank you. And maybe uh, maybe last one for this evening from Molly. Is there anyone who shouldn't get the vaccine? Yes, so thanks, Molly. There are two patient groups that should not get the vaccine. Number one, as I have uh, just said, people who are allergic to one of the ingredients of the vaccine. So if you have an anaphylactic reaction to one of the components of the vaccine uh, or, or have had an allergic reaction to the vaccine itself, don't get it. Um, and the second population of people that shouldn't get the vaccine is people who are actively infected with COVID. Now, that is people who are infected and infectious. So if you have been told by public health to isolate because you have the infection, so that's for 10 days from when you develop symptoms or from when you had a positive test, you should not be getting vaccinated. That's a very, uh, that, that uh, direction is really because we don't want you going to a vaccine center uh, to expose other people who um, have not uh, been exposed to COVID or who haven't been vaccinated yet. So it's more of an infection control measure uh, rather than a safety issue. Dale, thank you so much as always. Thank you for your uh, your expertise and your wisdom and uh, uh, the, the calmness and demeanor that you bring uh, to all of this and, and the leadership you've provided uh, in our community and beyond. Um, throughout this uh, this entire pandemic, I think it really symbolizes the uh, the the kind of calm preparedness that I've seen um, of our leaders uh, in at JBH throughout this whole process. Uh, it is one of the things that is most rewarding about uh, being a part of this uh, community, um, as is all of the ways that people uh, in the community are looking out to to help and support. And so, folks. As we said, now is the time to stay the course, um, to stay home, to prevent um, uh, spread, and to uh, um, to help uh, all of us um, in the healthcare sector be able to take care of the people that need to be in hospital. And if you are the people that need help, then to reach out, and whether that's um, need help medically, whether that is mental health and addiction supports, we are here, uh, Joseph Brand Hospital and our partners, we are here for you. Um, and uh, thank you for, um, thank you for uh, your support and for looking out for your loved ones and your family and your community and for all of us. Um, and uh, if you're looking for other ways of, uh, of, of helping others, there's always interesting ideas um, at the, uh, the Joseph Brandt Foundation website. So that's jbhfoundation.ca. Um, the foundation has been behind the scenes uh, quietly uh, orchestrating all of these uh, uh, um, 
Jay talks um, at, uh, you know, in the evenings, um, you know, it's just many of the leaders that, um, that are putting so much time uh, into this that again makes it so heartening to be, um, uh, to be part of this, this family and this community. Um, and, uh, and so thank you to the foundation for your support and thank you to all of you for supporting um, uh, through the foundation. Um, and, uh, oh wait, there is one more question. Uh, tail, there is, um, there is a big push from people out there. I don't know how you feel about this, um, but people want to see Lloyd. Lloyd, my dog. And apparently Lloyd, Lloyd is your dog. Is there any uh, way that that's gonna happen this evening? No, he's downstairs. Uh, oh. He's nowhere near her. Uh, okay. You know what? That just gives people a, a reason to tune into the next time that Dale joins us. This is, I've um, got a picture of Lloyd here. This is oh, Lloyd. there we go. This is Lloyd uh, watching a video of uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci. So uh, clearly infectious diseases runs in our family. So that's, awesome. that's Lloyd. Dr. Dale Kalina, thank you as always, everybody. Thank you. Um, take care. We will see you next time. Have a good evening.